so in our next section, we're going to talk about configuring a Cisco router, which really, outside of configuring routing protocols and setting up some of the advanced features of the router, is no different than configuring a switch. We have our running config, we have our global, our, our, um, global uh, configuration options, we have our specific sub-interface sub or sub-configuration options and so on. So that's what we're going to talk about in this particular case, the different um, options for configuring our routers in our topology. So we're going to go through some of the initial steps to configure our routers. We'll also talk about configuring and verifying interfaces. And then how do we verify that we actually have connectivity to our neighbors? Uh, and this is primarily done through something called Cisco Discovery Protocol, but we'll also talk about the link layer discovery protocol in this process as well. And we actually have a couple of discoveries that we'll run through as part of this discussion. All right, so the initial router setup is just like the switch. The router itself has multiple interfaces. Uh, it has a management port. Uh, that management port or out-of-band management port is the console port. We would connect to that console port just like a, a, a switch, and that would provide us the ability to start uh, configuring that device. Unlike a switch, though, switches out of the box pretty much function. All the interfaces are turned on by default. Everything is in VLAN 1. So if you took a switch out of the box and plugged a bunch of computers into it uh, and gave IP addresses and whatnot to those computers, those computers would be able to communicate through that switch. A router, by default, doesn't have any functionality. The router, by default, all the interfaces are disabled. There is no default routing protocol that's enabled on the router. It's a, uh, it, it basically needs to be configured from scratch, and that's a part of what we're going to be looking at in this particular case. We did talk about the console port, uh, which is this port right here, um, and in some cases we have a a micro USB option for that as well. We can see that here, the USB console. Uh, it depends on the platform. This is a 4321, so it, uh, it only has, well, actually it has uh, a couple of auxiliary ports in this case, but it has this USB uh, console port. Uh, this power socket, again, that is for, uh, in this particular router, that is not a DC power source, that's an AC power source. Uh, but we have different, these are kind of little um, uh, kind of single 1U form factor routers, so they don't require a, a, a very large power source. But uh, So we've got the different modules, different interfaces that we have to configure, and so on. All right. When we go into the router and we go into the console port, these are the typical settings that we would have for that console application. Speed is a whopping 9.6 kilobits a second, 9,600 bits per second. The data bits are eight data bits. Parity is none, stop bits is one. Flow control, I have seen, depending on uh, the uh, terminal application, you might have to switch the flow control to hardware uh, versus none. Uh, I've seen scenarios where you connect with a flow control of none, and for some reason the console's non-responsive, but I found that when you switch to uh, a flow control of hardware, it works. So that's just something to keep in mind. When the router boots up, it does its post, the power on self-test. It's verifying the functionality of the CPU, the memory. It's basically diagnosing the function of the router components. It finds the iOS. Where is that iOS stored? No, that's the startup config is in NVRAM. The iOS is stored in flash, and it loads the iOS into DRAM, our dynamic RAM. All right, the actual iOS that's stored on the flash drive is actually compressed. It's a .bin file, a binary image, uh, and it gets uh, decompressed into a .image file, and it gets run in memory. When you go to download the images from Cisco.com, you're downloading those .bin files uh, they have some other extensions nowadays these two, uh, as well. It finds the configuration file where? In the non-volatile RAM, right. The configuration file, meaning the startup config, and it loads that configuration file into DRAM, uh, and it becomes the running config, all right? So we're kind of, they're kind of walking through the process here, 
If for some reason you go into the router and the router doesn't have a startup config, that's where it might ask you, do you want to uh, continue with the configuration dialog? Uh, what we call the, the setup wizard, if you will. And again, we don't usually use that uh, because uh, it asks you a whole bunch of you know, basic questions on how to set up the device, but a lot of those questions are not very relevant to what you're trying to accomplish. So oftentimes we'll just say no, and that will take us to our standard prompt. We talked about the prompts in a previous lesson. Uh, router X, that's kind of interesting. It's not really the default name. The default name would typically just be router, but this is user exec mode, and we talked about how to get into privilege mode and so on. All right. The setup mode itself, as the book says here, it's not really intended for doing complex configurations. It kind of just walks you through some basic setup. Setting up the interfaces, maybe turning on network time protocol, maybe setting up some sort of basic management, setting up authentication, stuff like that. Basically the minimal features that you need for the, the router to boot. Uh, I would say for the most part, we don't need setup. Uh, if we did uh, want to run setup, we could run setup by typing the setup command. But for the most part, we basically just get out of that setup configuration mode or cancel that configuration dialog and then we just start configuring the device um, uh, statically, right? We just configure the device uh, as, we, as needed. Uh, a very useful command as well, we talked about this in one of our previous lessons is the show version command. It shows you things like the iOS version that's running on the platform, how the device was booted up, uh, how long it's been active, uh, here's how the device was booted up. It was uh, reloaded, uh, restarted at this time. What is the image? Uh, in this case, we're, this is a virtual image. So we see Unix, iOS root, Linux, Advanced Enterprise K9. Very similar to the images that we're running in our class with the uh, iOS V. Uh, and then it gives you a bunch of other things. It gives you licensing information. If it was a real router, it would give you licensing information. It would give you um, interface information, memory allocation information, and so on, uh, even serial numbers and whatnot. We also talked about the show running config. This shows us our active configuration in DRAM and so on. Uh, we don't talk about that too much now because we've already talked about that in one of our previous exercises. Configuring the interfaces. As I mentioned before, Router interfaces are not configured by default. They're not enabled, they're not configured by default. So it really depends, uh, uh, you have to actually go in and configure these interfaces for the first time once the device boots up. And we do that by going into global configuration mode and then going into the specific interface that we want to configure. And there's all different types of interfaces that exist on the router. You have serial interfaces, you have LAN interfaces, maybe 10 meg ethernet interfaces, fast ethernet interfaces, which are 100 meg, gigabit ethernet interfaces, which are obviously a one gig, 10 gig, 20 gig, 40 gig, and so on. So the interfaces are identified by their speed, and then they're identified by their interface number. Sometimes it's two numbers, sometimes it's three numbers. The number indicates, so for example, if I say fast ethernet, 0 slash 0 slash 0, it just basically indicates the position of that interface on, in the, on the motherboard. So it could be in a particular slot, it could be a particular port, uh, and those numbers will change depending on where the interface is installed on the router. Remember, most of these routers, most of these routers are modular. If you go back to the history of Cisco, uh, some of the very first routers that we saw with uh, Cisco were the AGSs. I actually have, uh, I'm a little bit of a, a geek in the sense that I collect old computers and old networking equipment. So I've got a whole bunch of old uh, computers like um, Commodore PET and uh, Atari 800 and Commodore 64 and stuff like that. And some, uh, I have a TI-80 and stuff like that, all working with operating systems. but. This was the actual, some of the very first routers that existed with Cisco. They're called the AGSs, or ag, uh, um, the uh, uh, aggregation routers. Uh, and this is literally what the cards looked like on the router. So they were 
uh, PC cards that were interconnected with these ribbon cables. Um, and I've got a few of those actually that, that actually do boot up. They run 11 code uh, and they actually boot up. But then you went to the 2500 series uh, series routers, not the RAM 2500. Uh, and uh, the 2500 series routers were uh, stackable routers, but they had a fixed configuration. So you had this router here that had these interfaces, but it wasn't modular, right? The interfaces were fixed, and you would actually have to buy a router that met your specific requirement. If you needed a router with five or six Ethernet interfaces, you would have to find a model that actually had five or six Ethernet interfaces. Nowadays, all of the Cisco routers are modular. So the 4400 series, actually well before this even, all these routers are modular. So you've got uh, these different slots and modules. And let me pick one, pull one, pull one up here. Uh, and uh, where is that image? Right here. Let's see, view image. And so you've got all of these different slots, these interchangeable modules. This is a UCS blade, so this is actually a, a, a VMware server. Uh, this happens to be an SMX module, so 24 port power over Ethernet module. Uh, we've got some onboard modules as well. So these are PoE gigabit Ethernet modules. Um, but you'll see the numbers, right? Giggy 001. The first zero represents the chassis. The second zero represents the module, and the third number represents, or the second number represents the module. The third number represents the port. So you'll see, for example, on this particular one, let me see if I can um, find it here. It might not be easy to see in this case. Uh, yeah, you can kind of see it here, right? Network interface module slot one, uh, and then uh, if I can get over, network interface module slot two, network interface module slot three. So again, depending on where you put the module, where you put the blade, uh, and, um, and, and, and where that the blade is attached will depend on what type of number, interface number you're gonna have. Those are the hard drives for the uh, UCS server. Uh, and then this is a 10 gig ethernet port two, port three, um, and I'm not sure why they have number two and number three as opposed to uh, uh, number zero and number one, but, and then you have your management port and some USB ports and so on. So again, it, it depends on the platform. Uh, different platforms have different uh, form factors. We call these ISRs, Integrated Services Routers. Uh, so they're modular, which gives you a lot of flexibility on how you decide to configure the platform. But just keep in mind, uh, the numbering of the interfaces is gonna change based on how the modules are set up and how the interfaces are set up and so on. A serial interface is typically a slower speed connection, uh, typically like a T1 type of connection. And that's gonna run different protocols like HDLC, the high level data link control protocol, or PPP, the point to point protocol, or maybe frame relay, uh, and so on. So we use these different interface distinguishers to identify different types of interfaces. So in maybe one router, you might see just an Ethernet 1. Maybe on a different type of router, you might see a 0 1. So maybe it's this is the chassis and this is the port because you might have multiple ports. Uh, or you might have different slots. So this might be uh, the chassis, which is maybe uh, like a stackable switch. This is the second switch in the stack. This is the motherboard, and then this is the port number within the switch itself. So it really just depends as to what type of physical device you have as to how the interfaces are gonna show up. The loopback interface, all right? Routers have loopback interfaces. Not by default, but you can configure loopback interfaces on a router. A loopback interface is a virtual interface. All right, and there's many reasons why you might decide to use a loopback interface. Uh, they are primarily used for management purposes, but they can also be used for controlling how traffic is generated from the router. 
If I have a router, for example, and I have three or four different interfaces on that router, the source IP address of data that's generated by that router is typically going to be based on whatever interface that traffic leaves from. So if for some reason this packet happens to leave from that interface, the source IP address of uh, uh, that packet is going to be that interface. If it happens to leave from that interface, it's going to be that interface. But I can create this loopback, this loopback interface on the router, which is a virtual interface not tied to any physical port. And in a lot of different protocols, I can source my traffic from a loopback. What does that do for me? That makes the traffic more predictable. I can set up security policies. If this interface goes down and we start routing out that interface, I'm still sourcing the traffic from the loopback, which means I can still have security policies that filter traffic based on that source address and so on. In addition, loopback interfaces can be used for things like router IDs, uh, for routing protocol processes like BGP or OSPF or EIGRP. They can also be used as destination IPs for management, right? Maybe I'm over here somewhere in the network, this is me, and I'm trying to manage that router. I can tell Net or SSH to that interface, but what if that interface goes down? Then I have to tell Net or uh, SSH to that interface. Or maybe I could just tell Net or SSH to the loopback interface, and it doesn't matter as long as that loopback interface is routable meaning it's part of my routing tables and the routers can reach it, I can come in on any interface to reach that loopback. So the loopback interfaces never go down either. They don't go down because they're not, unless you administratively shut them down, they don't go down because they're not tied to any physical port. They're not tied to any physical cable. All right, so there's no, there's no kind of physical concept. When you want to create a loopback interface, you just create it on the fly. And you can create uh, 4.2 billion loopback interfaces. At least that's the numbering scheme that you have. Uh, it's a 32-bit wide field, so you have up to 4.2. Uh, let me show you the number exactly. So uh, it's 2 to the power of 32. So that's, that's basically how many uh, how many choices you have for numbering your loopback interface. Uh, for, for just giggles, you might just choose to use that number. For, so the next administrator that goes in is like, why do you have that as your loopback interface? But uh, you can create as many loopback interfaces as you like. There's really no need to create maybe more than one uh, because, again, they're not really routable. I mean, excuse me, they're routable. There's no attached hosts on those interfaces. So. Uh, the IP address, for example, that you would assign to the loopback interface would be a host address, uh, a host route, right? You can assign a subnet. You don't have to use a 32-bit mask on a loopback interface, but, you, uh, but there's no reason not to because there's no actual physical devices tied to that interface. It is still a Layer 3 interface, all right? You do, still have to administratively enable the interface. Um, so uh, you have to do a no shutdown. Just like any other layer three interface, you're going to have to do a no shutdown in order to, uh, to enable that interface. That also applies, by the way, to physical interfaces. Go into the router interface, do a no shutdown. We've already kind of talked about this in some of our previous exercises. By default, all of my router interfaces are turned off. Uh, so by executing the no shutdown command, we're telling that interface to, to come up. It doesn't mean the interface is going to be functional. We still, have to, um, we still have to make sure that we have a cable plugged in and we have an appropriate IP address assigned to it and so on. So how do we assign an IP address to our interface? Pretty straightforward. I go into the interface, do a no shutdown, which I don't technically have to do to assign an address, but if I want the interface to run, and then I assign the address by putting in the command IP address. Now in IPv4, I'm actually limited to assigning only one interface or one address to that interface, one primary address to that interface. I can do secondary IPs uh, by adding the keyword secondary at the end of this command. So you could potentially put more than one IP address on an interface. 
uh, but it can only be in one broadcast domain. In IPv6, we can actually assign as many subnets to the interface as we want. We can actually have four or five or 10 or 100 different global unicast addresses assigned to an interface. I'll show you guys that a little bit later on. All right, so really, really simple concept. To take the address off, no IP address. Uh, to change the address, just put the IP address command in again. We do not have the option of entering the mask in prefix notation. We have to enter the mask in, in uh, dotted decimal notation. Once I've configured the interfaces and I've turned them on, my next step would be to verify the status of the interface. And this is really, really important. This is perhaps one of the most useful commands that you have. Uh, as I mentioned in our previous discussion, it's kind of like the Phillips head in your tool chest. Show IP interface brief, and we'll see this in our discovery, but show IP interface brief shows me the status of the interface, the physical layer status and the data link layer status. It will even tell me if there's an IP address assigned to that interface. Um, show protocols uh, is another command. I don't actually ever really use this command. I haven't, I've show IP protocols I've used all the time, but show protocols type interface ID I haven't really used too much. Show interfaces, this is a useful command as well. It's very similar to show IP interface brief, but the difference between show IP interface and show interface is show IP interface shows me all the logical functions of the interface, whereas show interface shows me all the physical functions of the interface. Things like speed and duplex, interface counters for things like CRC errors and framing errors and so on. Of course, there are many other commands that you can use to verify the operational state of your platform. Um, there are probably about five or six commands that we use all the time. Things like show IP route, show IP protocols, uh, show IP OSPF or show IP EIGRP interface, show uh, IP interface brief. So you're going to find that there are actually really only a, a, subset of pro, a subset of commands that you're going to run to verify uh, a, you know, the functional state of your device. Uh, for example, show IP interface brief, right? We talked about this command previously. The status column indicates the layer one status of the interface. The protocol column indicates the layer two status of the interface. So that's a, that's a very useful command for basic troubleshooting. Remember we talked about what kind of status output you would see here. Up, up indicates that the interface is operational and functional. Up, down would mean that the physical layer is working, but the data link layer is not working. Down, down would indicate that the interface uh, isn't getting a physical layer connection. Uh, and then administratively down, down means that the interface is shut down, right? We see administratively down and down here, uh, administratively down, uh, down listed, right? That's actually the, the format is a little bit messed up. It's administratively down and then down, not administratively down, down, uh, if that makes sense. All right, so uh, there are, this is again, one of those outputs that is extremely helpful because it does give you a very quick indication of whether or not your interfaces are functional. All right, so what is the type of interface? Is, the, is there an IP address assigned to the interface? Is the interface okay, right? Okay means that the, is the address valid? Maybe you've assigned a, a, an address for some reason that overlaps with another interface. You wouldn't be able to do that if the interfaces were active, uh, but you might be able to do it if the interfaces are not active. Because um, if you try to do it when the interfaces were active, basically you would just get a overlapping uh, address uh, error and it would just wouldn't let you do it. Show protocols, uh, again, not a command that I use too often, but it tells you what kind of protocol is running on the interface. In this case, it's running IP. Uh, this is the IP address and prefix uh, on the interface. Uh, and again, it shows us the status of the interface. The first up indicates the physical layer. The second up indicates the data link layer. Show interface without the IP keyword, right? It still gives us some of the IP information, 
but it also gives me all the hardware information. The MAC address, what type of encapsulation I'm running on the interface, the speed and the duplex, and then it gives me a whole bunch of different statistics on, uh, you know, if the interface is clean, if it's running, uh, if, there's, if it's seeing errors and so on. And, and uh, that's, that's pretty important as well. All right, so let's break down some of these. The hardware displays the hardware type, in other words, the media access control address. If you have a description configured on the interface, you'll see the description, the IP address, the MTU of the interface, the bandwidth of the interface. These values are really important because these are values that are typically used by routing protocols. Remember we were talking about that in the previous section? What is the bandwidth that's used in the calculation of the metric? It is this bandwidth that you see here. That is the number that's going to go into the metric calculation. In EIGRP, the delay is also used. So that's the delay value that's going to go into the metric calculation. So if you're ever curious about what values are actually going to be used by uh, an algorithm, just do a show interface, and it's these numbers that are going to be used by the algorithm. This doesn't tell me whether it's manually configured or not. Uh, if I set the bandwidth on the interface, it would be the value that I set would be reflected here. Uh, so it doesn't indicate that this is the default bandwidth or this is the configured bandwidth, but this is definitely the value that's going to go into my metric calculation. All right, delay is actually uh, delay is actually a way that we define what we call serialization delay. Serialization delay, oh, stop, let me. So we call this serialization delay. It defines how much time it takes to process data from the transmit queue out the interface. Delay, this is not like uh, how long does it take to like processing delay or some variable delay value. It's a fixed delay value based on the type of interface. So again, this is something that would be used in say like an EIGRP metric. All right, uh, MTU is the MTU of the interface. Delay, uh, again, uh, uh, to compute uh, based on routing protocol metrics and so on. Reliability and load uh, display the operational uh, efficiency of the interface. Uh, the more, uh, you know, if I'm dropping packets or not dropping packets. Again, these are values. Reliability and load would be uh, actually typically values that would be used for EIGRP to calculate a metric in EIGRP, uh, but they're not used by default. So we don't really look at those values too much. Encapsulation uh, defines what type of encapsulation is running on the interface. On Ethernet interfaces, it's almost always going to be ARPA, the uh, Ethernet 2. Uh, the um, uh, protocols that you might see on serial interfaces might be things like PPP or HDLC or Frame Relay and so on. All right. So uh, again, show IP interface brief shows us different outputs. I think I've already kind of described what these are. This means the interface is shut down. This means there's a uh, possible physical layer problem. The no shutdown command was executed, but the interface is not operational. This means that there's a physical layer attachment. We're, we, we don't have any problem with the physical layer, but there is a problem with the data link layer. Uh, and then this indicates that the, the interface is operational, at least from a layer one and a layer two perspective. Okay, so let's go ahead and get into our next section here, which is our first discovery in this section, which is configuring the interface on a Cisco router. All right. So in discovery number five, we're going to take a look at uh, basic, really basic configuration. Uh, everything in this topology is configured with the exception of the fast Ethernet 00, 00 interface on router one. Uh, so obviously that's going to be our goal here is to set that up. I'm going to go ahead and go into my consoles here. Uh, I'm going to go into router one and I'm just going to verify uh, the uh, operational state of the interfaces on router one. All right, and we do that by quick, do a quick show IP interface brief, and we can see that fast Ethernet 00 doesn't have an address assigned. It's administratively down. The only interface that happens to be pre-configured in this particular case is the uh, loopback interface on the router. So I'm going to go into global configuration mode, 
and I am going to uh, obviously set up this particular interface. So we're going to go into interface, fast ethernet 00. We can abbreviate the interface just like always. Uh, I'm going to put in an IP address 10.10.1.1 with a mask of 255.255.255.0. Like I said, I can also put in a description, link to SW2. Now, as I was mentioning before, they didn't really go through this in the lab. We do a no shutdown as well to turn on the interface. I can do another IP address on this interface. Uh, so for example, I could do secondary. Uh, I could do IP address 2.2.2.2.255.255.255.0 secondary. So I do have the ability to do show run interface FA00. I do have the ability to configure secondary addresses on the interface. There really isn't a need to do this. I mean, there's very few cases where you would want to put secondary addresses on an interface, but you can only have one primary IP address on the interface. Uh, in IPv6, it's different. In IPv6, you can actually have multiple primary addresses on the interface. If I do a show IP route and I say include connected, we can see that those networks actually show up as connected networks. Even though they're secondary networks, they show up as connected networks. They're in different subnets. So basically we created uh, multiple broadcast domains on the same physical interface. Wasn't part of the lab exercise, but I thought since we had talked about that, that I would show you that. Um, and if I want to see the local routes, I can see the local routes as well. So pipe L. So these are my local and connected routes. This is the actual network. This is the address of the interface. Now, if I just do a show IP route, remember what I was talking about when we were looking at the routing table previously? I said there was pieces missing from the routing table, the categories. This is a category. I can tell it's, a, it's kind of a classification section because it doesn't have a code next to it, right? So this is basically saying, okay, these are all my one subnets, these are all my two subnets, these are all my 10 subnets. One subnet is variably subnetted, two different subnets with two masks, 24 and 32. Two, two network is subnetted, two subnets, two masks. There's the subnets and the masks. The 10 network, four subnets, two masks. One, two, three, four, 32 and 24. So again, it's just a way of organizing the table. And again, I said this before, we organize it in chronological order as well, right? Or numerical order, I should say, right? So the one subnets fall before the two subnets, before the 10 subnets, and so on. Remember when I was talking about creating a loopback interface? Interface loopback. So I can say interface loopback. And then this is the number of interfaces. Uh, number is a little bit less than what I had said. I think I said 2.4 billion or something like that. Uh, but it is uh, 2 point something billion, right? Because that's 147 million. So that's 2 point something billion. So it's not quite two, the, the 2.4 billion that we talked about. All right, uh, but I can create these loopbacks. I can say loopback 100, loopback 101, loopback 102. Notice when I create these loopbacks, what happens? They actually come up automatically. If I do a show IP interface brief, you can see that the loopback interfaces are automatically enabled. Unlike the physical interfaces, which are shut, shut down by default, the loopback interfaces are automatically enabled. Because it's basically saying, look, you're creating this loopback, that means you must want to use it. If you're creating the loopback, you must want to use it. So let's do a basic ping now. Oh, and by the way, to, to remove those, no loopback 100. Uh, no interface loopback 100, or 101, or 102, uh, or um, I think that's all I created. Right? You can't create physical interfaces on the fly, right? I can't come in here and say interface serial 00, right? Because it's going to say, well, there is no 00 interface on this router. All right? We do have serial interfaces, but we don't have 00 interfaces. Okay? So I can do a ping. Let's go ahead and ping PC1. 
the first ping's probably going to fail, but the remaining pings will probably go through. Right? We had a couple of pings that failed there. Again, that's the, uh, the ARP request process that we'll talk about a little bit later on. So let's get out of config mode. And uh, go into our next task here. Verifying the status of the interfaces. All right, this is also uh, something that we can do. Uh, show run, for example, interface fast ethernet 00. I can see the configuration of that interface, so I can kind of pull out that particular configuration. Uh, I can also do a show IP interface brief, which I've already done a couple of different times. Show IP interface brief shows me the operational state of the interfaces, again. All right, what else can I see? I could do a show interface. For example, show interface fast ethernet 00. And I see all the same stuff we talked about in the lecture, which is the MAC address, the description, the IP address, all the variables that are used for things like metrics, the uh, uh, keep alives for the physical layer, keep alives, the duplex speed, the, uh, the uh, ARP that we're using, uh, or the encapsulation type we're using, all the different out, uh, input and output errors, the flow rates, and so on. Uh, if I wanted to change the bandwidth of an interface, I simply type bandwidth, and I put in the bandwidth that I want to have. All right, so I could make this, for example, one kilobit, or one, uh, a th the bandwidth is done in kilobits per second, so that would be 1,000 kilobits per second. Uh, I can also set the delay to say 5,000 microseconds. Uh, actually, the delay is entered in tens of microseconds. So even though it's written in microseconds on the show output, the delay is entered in tens of microseconds. So if I put a 5,000, that means a delay of 50,000. So do show interface FA00. We can see that the values that I put in are now reflected in the show interface output. All right. Uh, let's see, what else do we have here? Um, that was step number three uh, as part of our configuration. And that was actually the last part of that particular discovery. So uh, there's some other things I could show you, I suppose. Let's say, for example, you're troubleshooting the router, right? Somebody says, ah, the network's not running correctly, or there's an issue with the network, uh, and you decide that you want to verify whether or not it's an issue with the interfaces. If you do a show interface, you can see all these different counters. And I'm not going to go through each one of these. There's a great document on Cisco's website that talks about what each of these counters represent and what types of troubles they would represent, for example, if you're starting to see the counters increment. Like, you know, what is a babble? What is a late collision? What is a deferred datagram? What is lost carrier? You know, we're not going to go through all these, but some of the basic ones, CRC error, right? The, the router received a frame that, that uh, failed the CRC. Uh, like, what is a dribble condition detected, right? Um, there are reasons why you would see errors in these particular cases. And again, I would reference, I would suggest that you take a look at uh, the document. Let me see if I can pull it up real quick and show you which document I'm referring to here. Uh, Cisco interface uh, counters. Uh, troubleshooting, uh, yes, show interface counter detailed, uh, understanding the uh, packet counters in the show interface rate command. That's not the one I'm looking for. There is a document, uh, Interface Counters Explained. This is probably not the specific document I was looking for, uh, but um, there is a, let me see if I can find it, Meaning of Interface Counters, uh, I, I don't know where it is specifically. I, I guess you would probably find it under something like this, troubleshooting uh, switch port interface problems. But there is a um, document that describes specifically what those counters represent. 
Uh, I can't find it right now, but if you kind of scour Cisco's site, you'll see that. And it, it not only describes what a dribble condition is, but it describes what could cause a dribble condition, how you might be able to troubleshoot that and so on. One of the things that I like to look at is this, right? The output rate and the input rate. Especially if I'm doing something like troubleshooting load balancing, where I'm trying to see if my load balancing algorithm is accurate, uh, if I'm load balancing across the interfaces correctly. I also like to look at output drops. That would indicate maybe FIFO Q problems. Um, there's, a, there's a Q on these interfaces. These, these interfaces have something called a, a TXQ or a transmit Q, which is the number of packets that can go into this FIFO Q to be processed. Uh, and I, I can't remember the command to show TX, show interface FA00. Uh, see if there's a, I know there's a, I know the command to change the Q depth, but I'm trying to remember the command to actually see the Q statistics. Uh, maybe stats, no. That's just packets in and packets out. Uh, but anyway, each, each interface has, uh, maybe it's under controller. Uh, let's see, hardware, hardware, software. I'm trying to see. FIFO queuing, that obviously is first in, first out. Okay, so this is the, the output queue depth. So 40 packets maximum in that queue. Depth, in that queue. Uh, a FIFO queue is whatever goes into the channel first is processed out of the channel first, right? That's what first in, first out means. So there's a, there's a transmit queue on this interface that allows us to identify or, or process packets out of the interface. So uh, if for some reason the interface is getting overwhelmed with traffic or that queue is getting uh, filled up, that's where you're gonna see output drops, for example. Now, these counters accumulate over time. So the router might be running for a month, it might be running for a year. So looking at the counters today might not, be, ref, might not reflect an issue that would have occurred a year ago, or it might not reflect an issue that's occurring now accurately. So what you might do is you might go and do a clear counters, and you would uh, clear your interface counters so that when you did a show interface FA00, the counters that you're looking at at this point are specific to what's happening now. So you might do a clear counters, and then after you do the clear counters, then you can go in and over a shorter period of time, monitor what's happening on that interface. So you can say, okay, yeah, it might show you that you have a thousand CRC errors, but those thousand CRC errors could have happened a year ago, or they could have happened six months ago, or they could have just happened gradually over time. The counters, as long as the router is up and running or the switch is up and running, those counters are cumulative. So you might decide to do the clear counters so that you can see something that's more real time. All right? All right, so that's the uh, end of that discovery. Uh, we will get into another discovery as part of this uh, uh, process as well, um, which is gonna be uh, exploring connected devices. So we'll see you. Uh, you guys in that, but let's go ahead and get into the lecture part of that and then we'll go back into that discovery. So in our next section here, we're gonna talk about exploring connected devices and really what we're talking about in this section here is really two things. Cisco Discovery Protocol, which is a Cisco proprietary protocol for identifying directly connected devices and the open standard version of Cisco Discovery Protocol, which is the link layer discovery protocol, all right? These are both data link layer protocols that allow me to identify directly connected endpoints. All right? Um, and, and it can be pretty, pretty useful, right? CDP, uh, which is a layer two protocol again, and LLDP can be pretty useful because it, it allows me to identify what types of devices I'm attached to. It gives me information about the operating system that they run, maybe some IP address information. It also gives me information about the physical interfaces that I use to attach to that particular device. 
So it could be a very, very useful uh, component in troubleshooting if you're trying to walk through a network or you're trying to identify maybe endpoints in the network that are, you know, what's connected to what and so on. So as I mentioned before, CDP, Cisco Discovery Protocol, is a data link layer protocol, a layer two protocol, so you don't actually need IP addresses on your interfaces for it to work. Uh, it is Cisco proprietary. It is a periodic based protocol, so it sends out CDP advertisements or CDP messages every X number of seconds. In this case, with CDP, the default is 60 seconds. And it basically provides information about the topology. Now, there are some other protocols in our network that allow us to, uh, uh, you know, to manage devices. CDP is not a loop avoidance protocol, right? It, it kind of suggests that it is in this particular case, uh, link disabled to avoid loops. What they mean by this, what they're saying by this is that router or switch B is going to have a CDP neighbor relationship with A, but it's not going to have a CDP neighbor relationship with E because spanning tree disabled that interface. All right? But the whole point of these, these link layer discovery protocols is to allow us to identify what types of devices and who we are attached to. All right? And, and we're going to obviously see this in, in, the, in the lesson. What does a CDP output look like? How can I control Cisco Discovery Protocol? How can I control how messages are sent and received? And, and how can I tune the protocol? Uh, but it gives me things like the device ID, which is essentially just the host name of the device. The port IDs, is the interfaces that I use to connect to that device. What are its capabilities? In other words, is it a router? Is it a switch? Does it do IGMP? Does it do bridging, uh, routing, etc.? And then what is the platform type? Is it a 4400 series router? Is it a 3800 series router? And those kinds of things. A lot of people, and, and you guys work in the defense space, so a lot of STIGs say we need to disable this protocol, right? Because it does provide information about the network. But CDP does more than just provide information. For example, Cisco IP phones use CDP to negotiate how they're attached to the network. They use CDP to identify what VLAN they belong to. Uh, and when we have an auxiliary VLAN configured on a switch port, for example. CDP can also be used to identify mismatched configurations on things like trunk interfaces with native VLAN and so on. So it is more than just a discovery protocol but it is primarily used as a discovery protocol. All right, how do we use it? We, uh, it's enabled by default, by the way, on most Cisco devices. If I wanna see the CDP database, I use the show CDP command, but we do have a couple of options here. Show CDP entry, if I wanna look at a specific entry in the database. Show CDP interface, if I wanna see which interfaces are running CDP. Show CDP neighbors, if I wanna see the overall table of my CDP neighbors and show CDP traffic to see uh, not only how often CDP updates are being sent, but also, you know, how many CDP messages I've received and so on. All right. Like I said, CDP is, is enabled by default on most interfaces, uh, except for some older devices. Why would you possibly want to disable this protocol? because somebody could use the information gathered from this output to discover information about your network. Maybe I have an interface that connects to a service provider, or I have an interface that connects to an external network. I don't want that individual to be able to use CDP, or conversely, LLDP, to be able to discover information about my topology. So there's two ways that you can disable CDP. You can disable it globally by using the no CDP run command, and that will shut CDP off on the entire platform. Or you can disable CDP on a per interface basis, okay? You cannot explicitly enable CDP on a per interface basis. In other words, shut it off globally and then turn it on on an interface. You can only explicitly disable CDP on the interfaces. 
So you can either disable it completely or you can disable it on a per interface basis. The most common way of verifying the CDP information, show CDP neighbors. All right, very simple. This is the host name of the neighbor. This is the, the local interface that I go out of to reach that neighbor. I'll talk about the whole time in a second. This is the capability of that neighbor. The table indicates what it is. So if it's a switch, does it support IGMP? That is multicast routing, right? Or multicast discovery, I should say, uh, to join and leave multicast groups. What type of platform is it? What type of, what, what is the port ID? The port ID is the neighbor's interface that they use to get to me. So this is my interface, and then this is my neighbor's interface to get to me. All right? So you could see how this could be useful for, say, mapping out a network. If you're trying to troubleshoot and you don't have a topology diagram uh, and you want to be able to map out a network, you can do that through the use of CDP. Uh, and, and again, CDP is used for other things as well. All right? Now, it is a data link layer protocol, which means it's not routable. So router A, for example, would never show a neighbor of switch B. It is based on the physical layer connectivity. Cisco Discovery Protocol is Cisco proprietary, but there are some other vendors that also run CDP. Uh, HP, for example, Hewlett Packard, they run uh, CDP. Uh, and then some, some specific uh, vendor platforms, some other vendor platforms run it as well. All right. So we see all the detailed information of the platform. Oh, the one thing I didn't talk about was the hold time. CDP is what we call a periodic protocol, meaning that it sends out advertisements every X number of seconds. A lot of protocols do this, like routing, routing protocols with their hello packets. Hold times define how long I'm going to keep information in the database if I don't get one of those periodic updates. By default with Cisco Discovery Protocol, the hello time is 60 seconds and the hold time is three times that value, 180 seconds. So if I don't get a CDP message from switch A within 122 seconds, it's a, a decremental timer, it counts down. If I don't get a, a hello, I mean a CDP keep alive or a CDP message from switch A within 122 seconds, I'm going to delete that entry from the database. So you see hold timers, sometimes they're called dead timers. Uh, with a lot of different periodic based protocols, and we'll see that later on. All right? So we send the information periodically. The show CDP neighbor output shows us all this information. I can also look at detailed information. So, for example, show CDP neighbor detail. It gives me a lot of the same information that the table does, right? Here's the host name of the device, here's the platform, here are the capabilities, here's the interface, here's the hold time. Here's the port ID, that's, again, port ID is my peer. The interface is me, okay? Uh, so my neighbor uses serial 001, and that serial 001 cable is plugged into my serial 000 interface. But look what the detail shows us as well. IP address, if there's an IP address assigned to that device. Operating system, it'll actually even show us even more information if it's a switch. Uh, but we do see more detailed information. So you could see why you would potentially want to disable this protocol on ex uh, external facing interfaces because somebody could say, oh, you're running a Cisco a 2800 router. You're running Advanced Enterprise K9 12412. Uh, uh, 12 uh, I happen to know that there's a vulnerability with 12412 that I can exploit, and so I can then start to launch my attack against that vulnerability or uh, based on whatever attack vector I'm going to use. So again, it's, it's something that you may decide to, to kind of filter out. What if it's not a Cisco device? What if it's a non-Cisco device? Uh, for non-Cisco devices, we use another protocol called LLDP, the Link Layer Discovery Protocol, uh, specifically 802.1ab. So it's an IEEE specification. Incidentally, do you guys know where the 802 comes from? That's the working group, right, for IEEE that happened to be formed in February of 1980. 
That's where the 802 comes from. So if you're ever trying to impress a girl at a party, you know, probably don't mention that. But uh, all right. So LLDP functions pretty much like CDP does. Uh, in fact, a lot of the commands that we use are very similar in LLDP. The only difference is LLDP is not proprietary. It's an open standard. Now, LLDP has a lot more functionality. It uses these attributes that are contained in something called TLVs. Uh, you're going to see a reference to TLVs in a lot of different protocols. EIGRP, for example, uses TLVs. I describe TLVs as like Tupperware containers. TLV stands for type length value. So imagine you have this cabinet of Tupperware containers, and they're just empty Tupperware containers, right? A TLV is like that. The type is the type of container. In other words, what is contained within the container? So that might be like writing a label on your Tupperware container to say these are green beans or these are mashed potatoes. The length is the size of the container. So you might have a lot of mashed potatoes, so you have to get a bigger Tupperware container. The value is what's actually inside, what's the data that's contained inside the container. Uh, so these TLVs are kind of like generic boxes, if you will, to store information for a particular protocol. They come in different sizes, they have different types, they have different values, uh, but it provides what we call extensibility to a protocol because it allows us to customize the protocol. And LLDP uses a lot of these TLV values to contain things like IP address, device ID platform, and so on. All right? Uh, some of the TLVs that are advertised by LLDP, the management IP address, system capabilities, system name. So this is not different than CDP, right? These are the same characteristics that we see within Cisco Discovery Protocol. All right. How do I enable LLDP? Well, how did I enable CDP? CDP run. Global mode, right? How do I enable LLDP? LLDP run. LLDP is turned off by default on most Cisco devices. So it is something that you would have to, uh, to enable. Now, on the interface, it's a little bit different. We don't do enable or disable on the interface. We enable or disable by doing a transmit or receive. So that's kind of unique. That's uh, something that CDP doesn't do. We can send LLDP but not receive LLDP, or we can do the vice versa, or we can do both. So we actually have the ability to really kind of customize how LLDP runs on an interface basis. How do I verify the database? Show LLDP neighbors, just like show CDP neighbors, and it's going to give me the information about my neighbors. It looks very similar, by the way, to the CDP table. Device ID, there's my local interface, there's my hold time. The timers are a little bit different with LLDP. Uh, I'm trying to think of what they are. I think it's 90 seconds. Uh, when we get into our discovery, I'll turn it on and check. But the timers are slightly different. Maybe it's 30 seconds and 120. Yeah, that makes sense, actually. 30 and 120 versus 60 and 180. So, because usually hold timers are three to four times whatever the update timer is. Uh, so 30 and 120 would make sense in that case. But again, port ID is my neighbor's interface and so on. So we see a lot of the same information contained in LLDP that we see in, uh, in CDP. All right, which brings us to discovery number six, configuring and verifying our layer two discovery protocols. So let's go ahead and jump into that. So in this last discovery in this section here, we're just gonna kind of go through and play around with uh, CDP and LLDP. The idea here is that we're trying to actually map out all right, in this discovery, we're going to basically just take a quick look at Cisco Discovery Protocol, the Link Layer Discovery Protocol. Um, assuming uh, we can see the physical topology here, obviously, but we're assuming in this case that we don't necessarily have a complete picture of the topology. Maybe it's a customer's network. We've gone in and we don't have all the details or all the information. So we're going to use CDP and LODP commands to determine the actual topology of the network. So the first one, first step that we want to do is to go into switch one and do a quick show CDP neighbors on switch one to see what 
uh, the relationship is between switch one and its neighboring device. So I'll come in here and I'll do a show CDP neighbors and we can see as expected, of course, switch two is my peer. I, uh, my local interface is gig zero zero to connect to that particular peer. Uh, the switch, uh, the device is a switch. We're not seeing the platform here in this case. Uh, and the reason we don't see the platform is because this is iOS V but normally we would see the physical platform and gig zero zero is the interface that they use to connect to us. All right. So again, the device ID column uh, basically shows me uh, the, uh, the, the host name of that particular peer. If I do a show CDP neighbor detail, I can see additional information. Uh, we can see it is a switch. Uh, we should be seeing an IP address here not sure why we're not seeing the address. Let me go ahead and check real quick. Uh, show IP interface brief and see if we have a VLAN interface. Uh, it's there, but it's shut down. So let me go ahead and turn that on real quick. Interface VLAN one, no shut. And let's go back to switch one. Show IP interface brief and make sure this one is turned on. All right. Now, it might take a little bit for that information to populate. Again, um, CDP doesn't do triggered updates. In other words, a triggered update is when something changes, we automatically send out an update immediately. That's typically what you would see with like routing protocols. Uh, but CDP just sends out updates every 60 seconds. So now we're seeing the IP address. We, uh, we got a new update. We can see the capabilities. We can see the iOS version. Uh, we can see, uh, and this is what I was talking about in the lecture, we can even see CDP information, right? Uh, or VTP, VTP information, excuse me. We're running VTP version two. The VTP domain is currently set to blank. The native VLAN is one, the duplex is full. So we're getting other information besides just basic connectivity information. Now, if I go over to switch two and I do the same thing, we'll do a show CDP neighbors. We can see that in this case, we have two different neighbors. Uh, switch one is connected on gig zero zero. Switch, uh, a router one is connected on gig zero one. Uh, this is a 7206 VXR router. We're actually running regular iOS for that platform. Uh, that's the thing about uh, GNS3. Um, you can only do, you can't do serial interfaces with iOS V. So in the future, if you guys are building labs and your lab needs a serial interface, you need to run um, regular iOS, not iOS V. And uh, we have a 7206 router configured with regular iOS here. So it is a router. It uses fast Ethernet 00 to connect to our gig 01 interface. And again, if I do a show CDP neighbor detail, I get to see the IP address information of that device. And I can also see the IP address information of the router in this particular case which again is our VXR router. So based on that output, switch two has two neighboring devices, both switch one and router one, and the IP addresses are 10.10.1.2 respectively uh, for the switch and 10.10.1.1 for the router. All right. By the way, if a device has more than one IP address, like a router would typically have more than one IP address, the IP address that's gonna be reported is the IP address where the CDP uh, uh, PDUs are being generated. So for example, if I come to this interface here and I right click and do uh, capture, I should see those, CTP, uh, those CDP messages. Uh, and they're actually addressed to a very specific multicast group, or a, not a, I wouldn't say multicast, a well-known MAC address uh, that is used for both CDP, spanning tree, and some other things. You can see it actually right here. CDP, VTP, DTP, PADGP, and UDLD all use the same destination MAC address. Uh, and those are DTP messages which are used for negotiating uh, uh, trunk links. But here's our CDP message. And we can see in that uh, CDP message, let me pull it over here, not a whole lot going on. It's encapsulated in 802.3 Ethernet. The source MAC address uh, and the destination MAC address are 
basically well known, right? The, specifically this destination MAC 01000 Charlie, CC, CC, CC. You can actually see a lot of the CDP information in the data field here, right? So this is the actual 802.2 snap header. Remember we talked about that when we talked about our different types of Ethernet. Uh, CDP uses 802.3 Ethernet as opposed to Ethernet 2. And then if I expand the Cisco Discovery Protocol information, I see the uh, CDP version, the time to live, which is the dead timer uh, of 180 seconds, the device ID. So these are the TLVs. Remember we talked about TLVs? Type, length, value. The type is what type of uh, field it is, and this is hex 1, which is a device ID. The software type is hex 5. The platform type is hex 6. The address type is hex 2. These are defined by the protocol, by the way, right? These are defined by the protocol. The length field is 7, all right? Now, that might indicate that it's 7 bytes, but it's actually not 7 bytes. We can actually see that it's uh, 16 bytes in this case, uh, or 16 bits, excuse me, uh, the 0007. And then the device ID is the actual data. All right, so this is software version, this is the length, and then we can see all the information about the software version, platform, address, port ID, capabilities, IP address, VTP management domain information, native VLAN information. So actually CDP could be used to identify a native VLAN mismatch on a trunk interface, uh, duplex, trust bitmap, not sure what that is, untrusted port, uh, and management address uh, is the IP address that's being reported. All right, so we actually get to see all this information in, um, in, uh, in the payload. By the way, this is what I do recommend. We probably should have been doing this for all of our discoveries, but I always recommend if you're talking about a particular protocol or if you're trying to learn a protocol, always go take a look at the Wireshark capture and see how the data is actually formatted because it can give you a really clean perspective of what that protocol is doing, how it's passing its information, how it communicates that information to its peer. So that can be really, really helpful. All right, especially when you start to get into some of the more complex protocols that hopefully we'll see later today and certainly tomorrow. All right, so we'll go to router one. We're gonna do the same thing. Show CDP neighbors. We have two neighbors in this case. Switch two, which is connected to fast ethernet zero zero and router two, which is connected to ethernet one zero. Again, this is a 70, uh, 7206 VXR. Uh, I can also do like, for example, a show CDP entry uh, and then put the name of the device. That's like doing a detail. It's actually the output is exactly the same as a detail, uh, but we're basically just looking at an individual entry in the database. So we see the same information. This is the router. This is the capability. This is the interface the whole time and so on. All right. So now we've basically kind of mapped out the entire network. Router 1 has a connection to switch 2 and router 2. Uh, on the local interfaces of Ethernet 1.0 or Fast Ethernet uh, 0, 0 and Ethernet uh, 1.0 uh, in this particular case. Uh, and we have the different addresses of 10.10, 10, 10, um, 10, 10 1.3 and uh, 192, 3.2, which I think we would see. Let me do a show CDP neighbor, wrong screen, show CDP neighbor detail. All right, uh, yeah, there's the 10.10.1.3 and there's the 10.10.1.1. So that's what we would expect to see in this particular case for those two devices. All right, let me check real quick uh, the IP, show IP interface br um, brief. Oh, come on. Doo -doo. Uh, yeah, that's probably, I think that's a misconfiguration. Uh, it doesn't really matter. We're not really trying to route in this particular case, but I believe this address is probably misconfigured. It should have been a 192.168.3.2 address, 
and not a 10-10-10-3. Um, uh, ten, 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 Let me go to router one real quick and do a show IP interface brief. Yeah, so Ethernet 1.0 is uh, 3.1, so we've got a little bit of a misconfiguration on this guy here. So config T interface fast Ethernet 00, zero and that IP address should be 192.168.3.2 with a mask of 255.255.255.0. So I should be able to ping 192.168.3.1, which is the neighboring router. Make sure I've got my physical ports connected correctly. So fast Ethernet 00 uh, is going over to Ethernet 01. Show IP interface brief. Fast Ethernet 00, and then on router 1, Ethernet 01, or Ethernet 10. That's curious. Why can't I ping? Show run interface Ethernet 10. Ping 192.168.3.2. Hmm. Ethernet 10. On router 1, Ethernet 1.0, fast Ethernet 0.0. Am I missing something here? Curious why I can't ping. Fast Ethernet 0.0. Ah, I see we got some, we got some leftover stuff here. Uh, I believe the MAC address is probably what's causing us a problem here. So let me do a, a default interface, FA00, and let's go ahead and go into interface FA00 and put the address back in. And now we'll try to do our ping. There we go. Uh, we had a duplicate MAC address because there's another MAC address in that same broadcast domain from a different device, so the device was kind of confused in that regard. I'll fix that file before I upload it uh, for you guys, so when, if you download it later on, it'll have the appropriate configuration. All right, so again, uh, that, that actually, kind of, um, uh, actually kind of speaks to maybe one of the benefits of using this protocol, right? I was able to recognize that there was a misconfigured IP address through CDP because again, CDP is layer two. It didn't matter that we didn't have layer three reachability. There was no IP connectivity between those two devices, but CDP still functioned because it works at layer two. So I kind of did that on purpose so that you would get, no, I didn't really, but, uh, uh, you know, we, that does prove to the, uh, you know, prove the concept that we're talking about um, uh, layer two, a layer two protocol, okay? Uh, so we've kind of mapped out our neighbors. Uh, so now what we're going to do is we're going to go through and we're going to disable CDP on all of our devices, and we are going to enable LLDP on the devices. So I'm going to use my scripting tool here. Uh, this is something that if you're using Super Putty that you'll have an opportunity to use. It kind of saves you a little bit of time. I can type config t uh, no CDP run and I can send that and it will send it to all of the devices in my console. Uh, you can use this little tool right here to pick which devices you want to send the commands to uh, and then you can use this little script tool here to enter the, the commands that you want to push to the devices. So it, makes it a little bit easier to configure multiple devices at the same time. So now if I do a show CDP, you can see that CDP is not enabled on the platform. All right, what would be the reason to run LLDP? Maybe it's a non-Cisco device, or maybe I kind of have a, a mixed environment where I have some Cisco devices and I have some devices that are not Cisco. So uh, let's do LLD, uh, LLDP run, 
to enable LLDP on all of our devices. That should have gone through uh, there. LLDP run went there. Interesting. It doesn't look like these routers support LLDP. Only the switches do. Uh, so this is a code thing. There is no LLDP option for these 7206s. Um, but, and by the way, LLDP is not really going to be compatible with CDP. It uses a completely different address format uh, to exchange information. So we'll just be limited to verifying the LLDP information on our two switches. But that's okay. We'll go ahead and do that on our switches. So I can come in here now that I'm running LLDP and I can do a show LLDP neighbor. Let me get out of config mode. Show LLDP neighbor. And as we mentioned in the, in the conversation, in the, the lecture part, the output here is almost pretty much identical, right? Uh, the device ID is the host name of the device. This is the interface. This is the hold time. If I do a show LLDP, I can see the timers, and, and uh, that does confirm that it's 30 and 120. So a little bit different than CDP in that regard, because CDP is 60 and 180. We've got 30 and 120 in this particular case. All right? So we still see the information that we would expect to see. Uh, I could also run a show LLDP neighbor detail. Uh, and again, this is just going to give me the details. Uh, we do get a little bit more information here. We didn't get chassis ID before with Cisco Discovery Protocol, uh, but we also don't see IP address at the top. We see IP address down here, um, but this is a, uh, a switch uh, and it gives us some information. What is it not giving us though? It doesn't give us VTP information. Uh, which kind of makes sense because the VLAN trunking protocol is Cisco proprietary, which means LODP is not going to have a TLV to carry that information. Now, if I go back to my Wireshark capture, which is still running, uh, I should be able to see that LLDP information. Let me make sure I'm on the actual right interface here. Uh, nope, I'm not on the right interface. So let me stop that capture. Uh, it's not letting me, there we go. All right, we'll start a capture on this interface because we're only running um, LLDP between the two switches. And let's just take a look real quick at what the LLDP frame looks like and kind of do a compare and contrast to what we saw with our CDP frame. All right, so again, LLDP is going to use a, uh, a similar concept. It's going to have a specific MAC address that it uses for data delivery. It is a layer two protocol, so again, it doesn't rely on uh, any kind of IP transport for its functionality. Um, so let's hope the capture comes in here. We should see, see it pretty soon here. Let's stop the capture there. All right. And let's see, that's my, I think this is my old capture. And this one is my new capture. I'm not. Not capturing any information, unfortunately. Um, I should actually see, even though the router's not running LLDP, I should still see LLDP on this link. Let me try and capture on this link and see if I can see anything. Uh, because, uh, again, we don't really distinguish which interface to run it on. If it's enabled globally, it's going to be automatically running on every interface uh, on that device. So I should see some LLDP information on this interface. Sure enough, we do right here. Here's our LLDP information. Uh, and interestingly enough, LLDP is carried in Ethernet 2 frames. It's kind of interesting. I mean, it's not a big deal. It's not like, oh, it's crazy. But, uh, you know, Cisco likes to use 802.3 Ethernet for their protocols. Uh, LLDP is carried over Ethernet 2. The type field is link layer discovery protocol, which is protocol 802.1, and then we can see the information. Uh, again, we, we don't see the same structure necessarily, but we do see the type length value fields, just like we saw with CDP. Type length value type, the length, and the data. Type length value type, the length, and the data. All right. 
So uh, uh, we see capabilities, we see the management address, uh, we see the uh, end of kind of uh, uh, an indication of the end of the LLDP message, if you will, uh, and we see some other information as well. So very, very similar protocol uh, to what we would see with CDP, very easy to implement. One of the things I will show you though is that on an interface, let's say for example, we know that this interface here goes to a Cisco device that doesn't support LLDP. And I've enabled LLDP globally on the device, but I want to suppress LLDP from running on inter interface gig01. So I would come into my device, go into interface gig01, and I would say no LLDP transmit and no LLDP receive. Uh, receive is not as important, but I would probably specify no receive just so that I can make sure that nobody can push, uh, nobody can push a bunch of uh, LLDP information into my device. Is there a particularly a vulnerability with this protocol? There is actually a vulnerability with both of these protocols. Uh, in, on YouTube, actually, there's a video. Uh, let me see if I can pull it up here real quick. Uh, which is a CDP DOS attack uh, and there are several different uh, uh, videos that talk about how you can crash a Cisco switch by overwhelming that device with Cisco discovery protocols, uh, Cisco discovery protocol messages. I'm not going to play the whole video, it's, I mean it's only 34 seconds so I guess we could take a look at it real quick. So it's the uh, the tool that this person is using uh, is uh, just a packet generator. Uh, and let me see if he's using Yersinia. We'll be using a software called Yersinia. Yeah. I'm going to show you guys how to get this package, but Yersinia is a great tool uh, to launch different types of attacks against uh, or network-based attacks or if they're not attacks, if they're just for testing purposes. But it's a great tool, it's part of Kali Linux. You can also get it um, uh, individually, or se I mean, you can get it as a separate package. Uh, Yersinia happens to be the actual virus that was responsible for the bubonic plague, but uh, you know, they're, they're pretty uh, creative in naming their, their tools. But uh, uh, you can generate CDP messages, you can generate DHCP, 802.1Q, 802.1x, DTP messages, HSRP, ISL, STP, VTP, uh, and uh, it's a pretty simple tool to use. You click the tab, Senior right, and then you just say list the attacks and it will say do you want to do a denial of service attack, do you want to do a spoofing attack, and then you click the button that says start the attack. So again it's like one of those little script kitty tools that you don't really need to know a whole lot about. Uh, to be able to launch the attack. But what this tool is doing is it's actually just generating uh, multiple um, uh, datagrams, CDP frames, with the, the values, right? The, uh, and these are the time to lives are, are written in hex, but these are basically those TLV fields that we saw in the Wireshark capture, all right? So um, interface, device ID, you could actually probably even uh, customize this. We've got TTL version. If you hit that extra button, you can add the extra TLV fields like management IP address and so on. And then all you do is you just start generating all this data. Devices, uh, including, uh, switches, so hubs. we'll let this play. Uh, you can flood hubs and uh, stuff like that. <clears throat> now, uh, fast I already had this. Here. IP address. Okay, so it, now let's this is flood this. Uh, where you're sending the data. The CDP table, the switch. But flood look the at the effect. Uh, table. Here's the uh, type of attack. So he clicked list attacks, and you can send one CDP attack a message. You can flood the CDP table, uh, and you can check the box that says make this a denial of service attack, and it will start generating thousands and thousands of data okay. grams. Now ultimately the effect of the switch okay. is so that the, we'll the control that plane of the switch gets overwhelmed 
with processing this information. That's pretty much it. We're just basically over, over, overloading the CPU with all of this information. So he's doing a ping to the destination, uh, to the switch, getting some decent response times, the pings aren't failing, and then as soon as he launches the attack, uh, the switch is gonna stop responding to data. Pinging and stop the attack. So you saw uh, just there, you saw all the unreachable messages. So now we'll go ahead it literally took only a couple of seconds to, uh, to flood that device with so much information that it wasn't able to respond. And I think he's actually using a physical switch in this particular case. Uh, so there is some concern about vulnerability with the protocol. And unfortunately with CDP, there's no way to establish some sort of authentication. All right, there's no way to authenticate uh, neighbors. Uh, so this would be another reason perhaps to consider disabling this particular protocol. All right, uh, as far as getting uh, this package, uh, if you go to osboxes.org, uh, osboxes.org is a site where you can download a whole bunch of, of pre-configured images um, and you search for Kali uh, and Kali is a, a is a package developed by offensive security that has a whole bunch of, of tools built into it for penetration testing and scanning and so on because you guys have VMware workstation on these laptops now your own laptop if you decided to install it you can download this uh, image for uh, VMware uh, 2020.2 and it's really simple you just download it and it's you deploy it pretty much like you guys deployed your GNS3 VMs uh, you have to set up the virtual interfaces so that you can connect to the rest of the network but one of the tools that's included in Kali Linux is that your Cinea tool uh, so it's a pretty useful tool for testing HSRP security testing routing protocol security and so on uh, and of course there's probably another hundred or two hundred tools in this package. I'm sure some of you guys have probably used Kali Linux before to do things. Um, but uh, it's pretty cool. All right. So I wasn't part of the discovery, but I thought, well, you know, I guess I'll, I was thinking about that. Like, what would be some other reasons not to run this protocol? Uh, that would be one of those reasons. All right. So that actually concludes this complete section. Uh, let's go ahead and just jump right into the next section.